So thanks again for um, inviting me. And uh, indeed, this is the famous Insel Reams where I'm sitting at the moment. Um, the topic of my talk, and it's, it's a different aspect of, of SARS-CoV-2 and of the pandemic that has not been touched on, um, is zoonosis pandemics from the animal kingdom. And um, I was interested in following the discussion that we just had. I mean, could we have been prepared a lot better? Now, I mean, looking back in history, uh, I, the, the answer is, of course, we could. Um, epidemics and pandemics are part of the history of mankind. And even if you only look back in the, la uh, in the last 10 or uh, 15 years, uh, we see that there are certain events that could actually have prepared us. And the one that I, or the two that I would like to focus is, I mean, SARS here in the first place, 2000, 2000, 2003, but then the swine flu pandemic as well, which actually was a real pandemic, although it was fortunately at that time, perhaps not so fortunately in the lessons learned, a less pathogenic virus. Now, when we talk about zoonosis, I think it's worthwhile to first define what we actually mean. I've heard a lot of discussions in, in SARS-CoV-2, whether this is indeed a zoonotic virus, uh, whether COVID-19 is a zoonotic infection. Um, so the definition that I would like to base the, the presentation on is zoonosis are infections which are transmitted naturally between humans and other vertebrates. And the, 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 the word zoonosis does not imply any direction. Um, so there is no reverse zoonosis. Uh, we have two words that describe directionality, uh, so if it goes from animals to humans, it's a zooanthroponosis. And if it goes from humans to animals, it's an anthropozoonosis. And uh, also, it sounds trivial to the experts, of course. Um, it's uh, surprising. I mean, how, how many people doesn't really recognize that there is no special barrier between humans and animals beyond species specificity. So what are the impacts of animal disease on, on human health? Um, it has been calculated that about 60% of human infectious diseases uh, actually have an animal origin, and at least 75% of the novel emerging infectious diseases of humans are zoonosis. And this is, again, not surprising. Humans are part of the animal kingdom in a, short, uh, in a shared so, so, uh, environment. Um, this is uh, phenotypically, uh, I mean, more obvious for some than for others. But biologically, this is still true. An example of the first case is um, a nice study that has been performed by um, the group of Sebastian and Carmen Dax Spencer at the Robert Koch Institute. And they documented in, in historic samples that measles virus, for example, which is a specific human virus, and rinderpest virus, which is a specific cattle virus, diverged uh, in historic times. Um, and they uh, um, calculated the, the point of divergence to the sixth century BCE uh, before Christ, basically in a situation where domestication has occurred of, of wildlife and where the first urban centers um, came into being. Now, when we talk about epidemics and, and zoonosis, uh, we have a basic um, um, outline that's repeating itself uh, over and over again. So there is the, the, reser the reservoir in the animal, be that wildlife, be that animals that are wild but close to humans, like uh, for example here poultry. Um, then we have the spillover events. These are regular events, basically that uh, where uh, pathogens probe for new hosts. This is an intrinsic situation. Um, we sometimes have a so-called bridging species, which is a species which is closer to humans than, for example, wildlife. That is an amplifying host, but it's also a, a, a bridging host and then adaptation to the human situation, to the new species, um, and then uh, the transmission um, between uh, uh, individuals of the new species. Now the question, is COVID-19 a zoonosis? Um, yeah, indeed. I mean, there has been so anthropogenic spillover to get this uh, infection started, most likely from these horseshoe bats uh, as a reservoir in Southern China. Also, we don't know when, where, and how this actually happened and whether the animal market in Wuhan played a prominent role. Then it switches to the human pandemic, and this drives the pandemic. It's human-to-human -human transmission. It's this selection for better transmission. It's, a, it's also a selection for less pathogenic virus. And then it comes back to the animal side, an anthropozoonotic transmission to kept animals, and we have seen this quite frequently. And from then on, 
um, a, a forward transmission from these infected animals to attending humans. Now we as, an, as the Friedrich Leffler Institute are interested in two points. Our missions are the health and well-being of food producing animals. So we ask the questions whether these animals are indeed susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 and whether they would become sick or represent a reservoir. And the second is protection of humans from zoonosis. Uh, so the question, can these animals, once they are infected, now also infect humans or are animals suitable as a model for human infections? Uh, we have quite a number of people that took part in this study or in these studies, which were quite extensive um, and quite laborious, just to give you an indication. They all have to be worked on in at a BSL-3 experimental facility. Um, here is an experimental infection in cattle. Here is experimental infection in fruit beds. We have two colonies on fruit beds on, on the island. And here is experimental infection of ferrets um, as a model for the human infection, not for the human disease, because these animals don't get sick, but for human infection and transmission. Now, to make a long story short, uh, we uh, developed this diagram that basically shows a, a fraction of the susceptible animals uh, that have been discovered. Uh, for us, the important issue was that livestock and poultry is not susceptible or barely susceptible uh, like cattle uh, towards the virus. Um, there are pets which show, which show an intermediate susceptibility um, and there are some of the models uh, like the transgenic uh, ACE2 mice and the Syrian golden hamster, which are in fact very easily, uh, very susceptible and can be very easily infected. Um, now there are two populations that actually had an impact on epidemiology. Um, so the question is, is there a relevant animal component in the current pandemic? And these two populations are indeed uh, deer. Um, and there has been reports in the last month uh, from Northern America that actually the white-tailed deer population, in particular in the Eastern part of the United States and reaching up into Canada is heavily infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, primarily with the alpha variant, but now also Delta has been found. And there are reports last year, um, or the end of the year before already, that mink farms in the Netherlands, in Denmark, and basically all over the world have also been hit by SARS-CoV-2 because mink is uh, also a highly susceptible um, animal. Um, and this um, appearance in mink farms resulted in the killing of more than 11 million mink in Denmark and the complete a discontinuation of mink farming in the Netherlands. Now, just uh, two weeks ago, last week actually, um, there were reports uh, from Hong Kong that hamsters uh, that were kept and sold from pet shops were actually culled over the fear of a first human animal to human transmission. And it seems to be the case that actually infected Syrian hamsters were imported from Europe and then transmitted virus to the local population. Um, this is relevant because Hong Kong has a no COVID strategy. So uh, every incursion of virus uh, results in very severe consequences. In Germany uh, and in Europe in general, um, I don't think that this animal component is relevant in the current pandemic. Uh, we have a, a, a situation in Germany that infections in uh, uh, kept animals are notifiable. Um, since two years, we had only 15 cats and four dogs. We know that this is the tip of the iceberg, but I mean, this, is, this shows the extent of um, the situation and the zero prevalence in the cat population in the random sampling is only 0.7%. It was in 2020, uh, it's a little higher last year. So animals don't play a role in the pandemic, in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic yet, I, I should say. But of course, uh, animals did play an important role in other pandemics. And indeed, many of the pandemics, if not most, actually uh, came from the animal kingdom to come back to the title of this presentation. Uh, there is Spanish flu, uh, which originated in, in the wild birds, transferred into pigs, and was then probably then transformed, transferred from pigs to the human population, not in Europe, definitely not in Spain, but uh, most likely in Kansas and in the United States. So this is a similar pattern that we've seen later with the swine flu in 2009, 2010, again, mimicking basically the situation. Um, there are uh, examples from Africa 
There is the MERS um, that uh, was transmitted to humans by camels, but probably also has an, a bad reservoir. And then there is the situation in China uh, with the different flu, be that uh, Asian flu or Hong Kong flu, um, avian flu, H5N1, SARS, and then SARS-CoV-2. In all these situations, um, it is quite clear that the infectious agent that caused the pandemic originated in animals. And the animals that are most likely to transmit um, zoonotic uh, pathogens to, to humans are those that are domestic. And this is a quote from a UN report that appeared in the middle of 2020 um, on uh, preventing the next pandemic that says, so unsurprisingly, the vast majority of animals involved in historic zoonotic events or current zoonosis are domestic. Livestock, domesticated wildlife, pets, which is logical as the contact rates are high. The emergence of a new wildlife zoonosis is, is extremely rare, but can be very significant. When you talk about pandemics in the last century, of course, we have to talk about the influenza pandemics. Uh, with the Spanish flu, Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, uh, the Russian and the swine flu, um, and fortunately the avian flu um, that was uh, prevalent since around 2003 did not lead to a pandemic yet. And all these different pandemics originated in animals. This has to do with the epidemiology of influenza. A. It's not humans that are in the center, it's the natural reservoir, wild waterfowl, that actually is in the center where all the different combinations uh, and, and variants uh, of uh, in avian influenza virus actually um, um, are propagated, are present. This is normal ecology um, of this population. And then we have the spillover events to humans, to pigs, to uh, cat poultry, and then transmission between these different populations. Now, these are the pandemics. These are the viruses that succeeded in really uh, getting a hold in the novel, novel host, humans, and being transmitted in, in the novel host very efficiently. But we have also very frequently single or spillover events that either do not lead to infectious change or to starting commencing infectious chains, uh, or only to very few infections. And these spillovers, they happen regularly, they happen basically all the time, and they happen all over the world. And this is shown here in this picture. This is also uh, focusing on avian influenza. And you see from Canada, from Mexico, to Australia, to Asia, to Africa, these spillover events that we detect. And we detect them because they may lead to clinical disease um, that they actually occur. And there is one I would like to focus on, which is H7 and 9. Uh, you see the numbers are different from many of the, um, uh, any numbers that are, are put on here uh, with the first case infected and then uh, uh, fatalities. And when we look at this emergence of zoonotic H7 and 9 in China, which started in 2013, so this was the initial spillover from, from infected poultry. Then there was a seasonality shown. Um, so there was probably refeeding of the virus from the infected poultry into humans. So that in, uh, the, in uh, the year 2017, there was actually a peak with uh, uh, more than 700 cases in humans. Before the virus could adapt further to really spread more efficiently, the whole uh, uh, situation was cleared by the initiation of our Chinese colleagues of our H5, H7 poultry vaccination program. And I think it's easily visible that this vaccination program actually led to a complete reduction. And at the moment, at least, H7 and 9 is not of a problem any longer. What is of a problem are other highly pathogenic avian infra virus, influenza viruses that are currently uh, um, uh, circulating in Germany. These are fortunately non-zoonotic or nearly non-zoonotic viruses, but still it shows that these viruses are basically around us for much of the time. What is mostly neglected in these dis discussions is that it's not only a forward transmission from the wildlife or the animal the reservoir to humans, we also have spillback situations. And these spillback situations are uh, predominantly relevant um, in the situation that developed in Europe in the last decades concerning porcine influenza A viruses. 
four, three of the four circulating porcine uh, 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 avian influenza virus are actually have a human origin. And the latest is the pandemic virus from 2009, H1N1 swine flu, because this is the one that now drives reassortment between these other, um, with and, and between these other um, um, swine influenza viruses of human origin. And these are novel viruses. The reassortants have novel biological features. And these biological features are important because they may also allow the virus to adapt better to humans. Um, these spillover events from the swine influenza uh, uh, situation to humans occur not very frequently here in Germany, uh, sometimes more frequently. This is a, a diagram from the United States. And you see here a large outbreak in particular in 2011, 2012 with an H3N2 novel variant um, that still didn't make it to a pandemic, but it is showing that these adaptation or transmission processes are going on all the time. And that's puts, that puts an emphasis on the interfaces. So interfaces is not only direct contact between human and animal. Direct interface is the consummation of products, is the use of products, is contact to product. It's indirect contact, even via dust inhalation or droppings. It is environmental contact, same water, uh, or water source or same surfaces. And in the case of vector-borne infections, the vector contact. And these interfaces and these contact points are increasing. Um, this has to do with the increasing human population. Uh, this has to do with the increasing demand for meat from this human population. Um, and uh, the uh, following up on the la last slide on the conclusions uh, of uh, colleague Bergerau, um, the uh, approach that is now increasingly being used is take a holistic approach, not a pathogen specific approach uh, and uh, focus not only on the human situation, but also include the animal and the environmental health situation. And this is what we call One Health. Um, there was the questions, will the COVID-19 crisis trigger, trigger a One Health coming of age? Um, and I think indeed that happened. Um, there is an international panel, the One Health High Level Expert Panel, that deals with concepts on putting One, uh, one uh, Health and the One Health concept on the ground. Uh, we have a new definition and uh, a new diagram that shows uh, what is required. It's intersectoral, transdisciplinary communication, collaboration, coordination, and capacity building. So very briefly, four lessons learned that I would like to, uh, to, to present at the end. First, zoonotic infections are part of biology. They can happen everywhere. It's not focused on uh, China or the jungle in Africa. What we need to do in, in terms of preparedness is surveillance in animals and humans. Uh, and in, teams, uh, in, in uh, terms of prevention, reduction of these critical interfaces. I do know this is much more easily said than done, but I think this is the, the thing that you, we need to strive to work on. With that, I'm finished and I thank you for your attention. Again, with a, a picture from the island and this one was taken two days ago out of my uh, office window. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Beautiful picture. Um, I probably can mention already, hopefully I'm allowed to do that, uh, that uh, the next annual meeting in 2023 will be on global health from Leopoldina. So hope to see you there uh, all in September. Um, are there any questions? Uh, Christian Bogdan. Yeah, very nice uh, presentation. I, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what's your opinion on the on the role of wild mice in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, uh, according to your experiences, perhaps also in, in the laboratories? Um, so the um, initial variants were, uh, were unable to infect wild mice. Um, you needed the, the transphenic mice. Um, this is a little different with the later ones, but I still don't think that um, animal populations, be that wild mice or, or any other, uh, did play a role, for example, in the development of Omicron. Uh, we don't have any indication for that. And I still think that the, the situation that uh, Omicron probably developed in an immunocompromised human situation is much more likely than uh, what uh, the, uh, any animal involvement. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, further questions? I'm curious about um, the 
crossing over uh, or crossing the barrier or the host uh, barrier. Um, in um, influenza, there are proteins known responsible for crossing the host bar uh, barrier. Um, I remember publication of my late colleague, Professor Klink, here in Marburg. Um, is anything known about the SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, situation? Maybe you're not the right person to ask. <laughs> I think, I mean, the issue, uh, the issue is primarily, I mean, receptor binding does play a role. Um, that's the same also for, for influenza, yeah. but we know that modulation of the immune response plays an important role as well. Uh, we have a, a very interesting example, for example, by this molecular gymnastics, it has been uh, proposed or predicted that the, the, the pick ACE2 um, would fit very well uh, towards the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain. Um, it's also true that you can infect pig cells in cell culture, but if you go to the complete animal, it just doesn't work, uh, which tells you, I mean, there is more than receptor binding. Um, and I mean, we um, hypothesize that it's probably then modulating immediate immune responses that, that play a role here. 